Hi, welcome to the Daisy Museum. My name is Oren Rybar. Uh, I assume you want to go through on a tour today. We have a uh, $2 charge for uh, admission for adults. Children under 16 are free. Uh, if you might like to tour the uh, offices and even watch an uh, air rifle being assembled, we can do that for you. We have various pricing schedules and can have a special gun built for you. While you're here, we'd like to have you sign our guest register and um, we can get you started. Uh, the first thing that you see right here is uh, an old piece of machinery which was donated uh, to the museum by John and Linda Groenwald. It's actually a Quackenbush dart machine. Uh, Quackenbush originally was building air guns but they got into the dart business and uh, as you can see they made these darts and Daisy actually sold these darts from 1910 to 1933. I started with Daisy in 1953 and I know at that time we still have, uh, had darts in our inventory. Over here on the side in our front window you'll notice that we have a display of uh, Roy Rogers guns Daisy, of course, has a long history with uh, cowboys, dating back probably to the early 30s when we were involved with Buzz Barton, who was a um, rodeo star and uh, movie star, but he was a teenager at that time. And then uh, that was in uh, about 32, 33, and all the way through the, the up to the 40s. Also, we had... Um, Buck Jones. Buck Jones was a famous cowboy movie star uh, during the 30s and into the early 40s. I'll show you some of those models a little later in our tour. Over here at the front we have a display that uh, involves uh, Roy Rogers and of course over the past four or five years we put out a number of Roy Rogers models starting with Roy Rogers and Trigger, then later Roy Rogers and Dale Evans, Roy Rogers and Gabby Hayes, and of course our latest gun uh, is the Roy and Dusty gun, Dusty is son. Dusty actually runs the Roy, uh, Roy Rogers Museum, which originally was located in Apple Valley, California, but is now located in Branson, Missouri. We came out with this gun last year, and of course it's available from the museum at, not, uh, at this time. You can see a number of these things. That most of the Roy Rogers things on display here are from their muse museum, with the exception of the guns. We came out with this uh, series of Roy Rogers guns back in the early 2000s, and of course, as I'd mentioned before, the first was Roy and Trigger, which uh, actually you can see right here. Um, the second one was, of course, Roy and Dale, then Roy and Gabby Hayes, who was his sidekick, and then finally the Roy and Dusty. Roy, uh, Dusty is his son. Of course, the first three guns are all collectibles now. The only way to get a hold of these is on the secondary market. The Roy and Dusty gun is available directly from the museum. Actually, it all started in Plymouth, Michigan, way back in the late 1870s, when a gentleman named Clarence Hamilton moved up from Ohio, settled in Plymouth, Michigan. He was actually a watchmaker and inventor by trade. Uh, he set up a little watch repair shop in the, in the front window, of actually, of a local drugstore there in Plymouth and repaired watches there. While he was there, he designed, applied for, and received a patent on a metal veinless windmill. He started producing these in a shop outside of his um, home about 1880. And by 1882, he had got a group of Plymouth businessmen together and they put up $30,000, incorporated and formed the Plymouth Iron Windmill Company. The first thing they did was buy 25 acres of land in Plymouth and built a two-story 8,000 square foot building, which you see here in this picture. They started producing the windmills, and I think everything was going 
fairly well, but by the mid 80s, business was dropping off and they were about ready to close the business down. I really think that if the problem was, I know the product was good, but I think if you stop and think of the period of time, that probably works against them. What they had was, a, first of all, you really had no advertisement. There was no radio, no television, basically no magazines, just newspapers. But the primary thing would be the fact that you had no means of transportation, no cars, no trucks, no airplanes, just wagons and horses or mules. So their, probably their main area of sales was a, right around the Plymouth area, which of course was in the nor uh, southern part of Michigan, or uh, northern part of Ohio and Indiana. So by 1886, things were really going downhill. In 1886, a gentleman named Phil Markham, who uh, had a small company that was producing uh, wooden water bu uh, buckets and water, uh, water troughs, was located uh, right across the tracks from the, the Iron Windmill Company. And um, supposedly he had a dream about an air gun for youngsters. Now, uh, air guns were not something uh, common at that time, even though the air gun history dated back to the middle 1500s. And a little later, we'll show you some pictures of air guns from the 16, 17, and 1800s. But at that time, uh, Mr. Markham um, approached the uh, local businessmen in Plymouth and tried to get a loan to start, uh, start him in this, on the venture with his air gun. He actually brought the gun and showed it to the gentleman in Plymouth, and uh, when they looked at it, they laughed at him. And uh, he had told them, of course, that this was a dream he had, and they said it looked more like his nightmare than his dream. As I pointed out before, uh, Markham had his dream back in 1886. And I'll, I'll show you that dream. Uh, this was the first gun. Uh, this is considered the f first commercially successful air gun built. And of course, you can see it has a piano hinge on it and cocked by pulling this down, which cocked the spring and engaged the trigger. And then you dropped a BB-sized lead ball into the barrel and closed it and pulled the trigger. That lead shot, that particular size, of course, is where the term BB comes from. People called the guns BB guns rather than air guns, but they are actually air guns that shot BB-sized lead shot when they first were invented. This happened in 1886, but I think I'd mentioned previously about the air gun history actually dates back to about the middle 1500s. And uh, we have some guns here that we'd like to show you. I'm gonna put this down. And uh, over here, we'll take a look at some of the air guns. Over here, we have a display of air guns that date back to the uh, 1600s. Actually, guns on display are from the 16, 17, and 1800s. Um, if, as you'll notice, some of these gun, guns look actually like um, firearms from that period of time. I assume that possibly what happened was that if you had a regular firearm but wanted to have an air gun, you could probably take it to a gunsmith and get it converted to an air gun much quicker than waiting to have someone hand build a, a gun for you. Now, for instance, this particular gun here is uh, from about 1800 and, and came from Austria. The cocking method, of course, was to, with this handle and you would crank it and the air chamber is in the stock. Now, one of the features of these guns was that when you pumped it up, you could actually get upwards of 20 shots. Even though the guns back then weren't designed as repeaters, after you fired the gun, drop another ball down the barrel, fire it, and you could get up to 20 shots. Um, the other type or method, if you didn't have a handle on the gun itself, was to use a pumping mechanism, which would be much like an old tire pump, 
and you actually detach the stock or stock receiver from the gun, such as you see here, with the, with the barrel gone, you would attach it and pump the gun up. Now you could get anywhere from 500 to 800 pounds pressure per square inch in one of these guns, which give, could give you a velocity upwards of a uh, thousand feet per second. I'd like to uh, read you a paragraph from this uh, poster on the wall that uh, tells you something about uh, air guns. And this was taken, I said, in the early 19th century, the Austrian army had an entire regiment which was equipped with 44 caliber repeating air rifles. These air guns were used with such deadly effectiveness against Napoleon's invading armies that any Austrian soldier captured with one was summarily executed on the spot. This particular gun here, as you can see, is a double barrel. This will give you some idea of the size of the balls that these guns shot. They weren't considered BB guns. They were all lethal weapons from that period of time. In fact, this top barrel is 46 caliber. The bottom barrel is 58 caliber. Uh, I've had uh, some collectors in here, and they said, well, this particular gentleman never built a double barrel. And I had a gentleman that came to visit us and said he would trade us a single barrel uh, along with some uh, good amount of money for this double barrel. But of course, it doesn't leave the museum. It stays right here. I'd like to point also uh, point out that the um, Lewis and Clark actually took an air gun with them when they made their trek across the United States back in the uh, early uh, 1800s. Um, the gun was supposed to have been uh, built uh, by Isaiah Lukens, who was from Philadelphia, Pan uh, Pennsylvania. But so air guns, even then at that time, they had taken them across. One of the last guns we have here is a gun that was called, it's called the Grant Air Rifle, and was actually built in uh, Newark, New Jersey in the late 1800s. Most of these other guns, though, were from Europe, and as we pointed out previously, the uh, air guns actually date back all the way to the 1500s. After Mr. Markham designed his first gun, he went to the local businessman in Plymouth to try to get a loan. And he told him about his dream. And of course, when he showed him the gun, uh, they actually laughed at him and told him, he said, it looked more like his nightmare than his dream. So. He went back, but he, he was undeterred, and he finally got a businessman named Chafee, a local businessman in Plymouth, to come into the company with him. And he actually uh, received about 10% of the company at that time. He also had a brother uh, who he hired as their first salesman. Now, the first thing he did was to take Markham's dream and go to Chicago where one of the largest store, uh, toy distributors in the country was located at that time. And he went in and sat down and then he talked with these gentlemen and showed them the gun. Now they didn't laugh. What they saw was something brand new to the market. There was nothing like it out there. And they said, we want two things. We want exclusive distributorship for the city of Chicago. And the second thing we want is the name Chicago put on the gun. And as you'll see on this second gun, which is a production gun, Chicago by the Markham Air Rifle Company of Plymouth, Michigan. They said, if you'll do that, we'll give you an order for 10,000 guns. Now, all of a sudden, this little company that had been producing wooden water buckets right across the tracks from the Plymouth Iron Windmill Company was rolling in money, and the windmill company was ready to close down. So Mr. Hamilton, who had designed the windmill and started the windmill company, and of course was the supervisor at that company, went over and talked to Lewis Cass Huff, who was the manager of the company. And he said, Lewis, he says, I know the way things are going here. 
He says, I know I can build a better gun than what Markham's doing. He says, I'm going to start my own air rifle company. So he went right around the corner from the windmill company and bought an old livery stable, converted it over, formed the Plymouth Air Rifle Company, and designed one of his first air guns. And it's this model that you see right here. Now it's similar to Markham's gun, but if you notice it has a one-piece stock. It doesn't break apart. All you had was a little cast iron cocking lever that you pulled down to cock the gun, drop the BB down to the end of the barrel, and would fire it. It was an instant success, and with a matter of months, he was actually matching Markham's production of 100 guns a day. Now, 100 guns a day doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to stop and think that this was back in the late 1800s, and everything was hand-built at that time. Now, at the same time, Mr. Hamilton was also working on another gun. And this is what he came up with. As you see here, an all-metal gun. Now, instead of building this at his own factory, he took it back over to the Plymouth Iron Windmill Company, again showing it to Mr. Huff. Mr. Huff tried it out, went outside and shot it, came back in, and he made the remark, boy, that's a daisy. And that was a slang term back then that meant it was neat, swell, sharp, or cool. So they decided to build that gun and offer it as a premium at that time because they were still trying to sell the windmill. That was the thing that started their company and they felt this would do it. So if you bought a windmill, you received one of these guns, which they called Daisy, and that name was put on each gun. And so the salesman went out and to see how they did. Well, they came back after, uh, he came back after a while and uh, said they loved the gun. Now this was all metal. The other two guns that were on the market were wooden guns. And this cocked, cocked of course, by pulling this shroud back, which actually cocked the gun. It also served as a front sight on this gun. So I, when the salesman come back, he said they loved the gun, but they didn't want to buy a windmill in order to get the gun. So they talked it over, the board talked it over, and they voted, and by one vote, Mr. Huss vote, they decided to build the gun for one year or as long as the money lasted. If they ran out of money before that time, they were going to close the plant down. This, this was the first gun, the Daisy, and uh, actually cocked. Uh, the shroud on the top, which is the um, actually rear sight, actually pulled back and cocked like this. That cocked the spring, and then of course the BB was just dropped down the barrel. Now when M Mr. Hamilton designed this, instead of building it at his own company, the Plymouth Air Rifle Company, he took it back over to the windmill company and showed it to Mr. Huff. And I think the reason that was done was because the windmill company had all the equipment there they needed to build this gun. The cast iron furnaces, the ability to make the cast iron molds, the stamped metal parts, they had all that equipment, but it wasn't being used. As I mentioned previously, this was the original uh, building which was built in 1882. This particular picture was taken in 1889. That's the uh, time frame when the decision was made to build the gun and see what they could do. Uh, they either made it or they closed it down. As I'd pointed out, they started in 1889 and actually in less than 15 years, this is the complex 
that they ended up with. So you can see that the daisy was an instant success. About 1915, you see a picture of the plant, and of course the front of it uh, is actually all covered with ivy. Now this was pretty well the same uh, as when we left in 1958, except for two, two things. There were warehouses built along the backside, and in 1939, Daisy had acquired the American Ball Company of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they had produ been producing steel shot for us from 1928 up to about 1939. At that point, Cass Huff decided that uh, there was no use us sharing the profits with them. Since we were building the air guns, we just as well build the shot too. And so a shot department was built in this area here. That was probably the last thing added to the company, uh, and that was 1939, and of course we moved in 58. Over here, you will see a number of items. The desk, the chairs are all from the old conference room at Daisy. Uh, this clock, uh, dated back to the around 1898. It's, it's uh, run by a dry cell battery and uh, we maintained it at the, at the old plant here in Rogers, uh, but it hadn't been working for a number of years and we had it finally a local um, clock repairman uh, uh, fix this up for us. These two gentlemen ran the company from the late 1800s to the middle of the 1900s. Uh, actually, Mr. Bennett, Charlie Bennett, was the first salesman of the company, was hired in 1891. Edward Kasthoff was the, actually the son of Louis Kasthoff, and he came to work uh, shortly after uh, Mr. Bennett did. Those two gentlemen between them ran the company for a total of 129 years. Uh, Mr. Bennett was there for 64 years, Mr. Huff for 65. I started with Daisy in 1953 and when I first came to work Mr. Bennett was still there. Uh, Charlie was a dapper uh, older gentleman, but very spry. He was always dressed to the tee uh, with a hat, and he had a cane, lived just about a half a block away from the company, and he walked to work every day. Uh, Mr. Bennett actually died in uh, 1956, September of 56. Mr. Huff, who had been the secretary treasurer and vice president, took over as the president of the company and remained as such until he died in 1959, which is about uh, half a year after we moved to Rogers, Arkansas. Above, you'll actually see a picture of the board, including Mr. Bennett, Mr. Huff, Mr. A.W. Shafee, who was actually the gentleman that was the first salesman for Markham. He came over to Daisy later, and I will tell you a little story about that. And the uh, fourth gentleman is George Hunter. Okay, that's... Over here you actually see a plaque with the service pins of Mr. Bennett, 64 years, and Mr. Huff, 65 years. Down here we actually have a little display that was sent to us uh, by the Plymouth Museum when they tore down uh, the daisy plant, they actually cut up some of the floors, which were all wood at that time, and you can actually see BBs that are embedded in the flooring. As we pointed out previously, this was the, uh, basically the first uh, daisy produced, top cocker. The second model actually was a brake action gun, which broke apart here at the stock and you cocked it, and of course the BBs were still dropped down the end of the barrel. Then you see, um, um, and that happened in about 1890, late 1890, they came out with the um, 
this model in 91, actually. And you can see that the uh, grip has changed so that it fits your fingers a little better. The next step was to offer the gun with wood. You could either get it with a wire frame or with a wooden insert. The next model was introduced in um, 1897 and was actually their Daisy's first repeater. It was a 48 shot repeater. This, this model was actually produced after the 1900s, but the original repeater was cast iron in this area and did come out in 1897, was an instant uh, success. The next step was uh, the 20th century model. Now this is about a 1901 model, but they actually come out in 1898, and this had a cast iron part here, and was called the 20th century, and it was a single shot, and uh, was very, very popular. Now in 1903, Daisy come out with the number 03, or what they referred to as the Bennett model, which was designed by Mr. Bennett. And it was the first lever action Daisy, 1,000 shot. And this basic gun is a still the same basic design which is used on our current spring air guns, such as the Red Rider. So that was 105 years ago this gun was introduced. Two years later, we came out with a 500 shot version of the same gun, which you see here. Actually, I don't know if you can even see the uh, engraving on the side which states it's a 500 shot model. In 1895, uh, the windmill company was basically out of business as far as producing windmills. So they thought they should do something about the name of the company. And so in January of 1895, for some strange reason, they changed the name to the Daisy Manufacturing Company. And over here you will actually see the first advertisement used by Daisy under their new name in 1895. With all the success that the Daisy Company was having, a number of other companies decided to get into the air gun business. Uh, at one point, we actually had three companies in the city of Plymouth producing air guns and selling everything they could build. Uh, over here, you actually see some of the other companies. The uh, Atlas Gun Company from Ilion, New York. Uh, actually was acquired by Daisy in 1905. They produced their line of guns for a year or so, closed the business down and probably kept whatever patents or things they wanted and, and machinery and moved it back to uh, Plymouth. Uh, the National uh, Company in St. Joseph, Michigan was in production. You can see one of their guns. The Warrior produced by the J.A. Dubar Company in Northville, Michigan. Northville was just four miles north of Plymouth. Um, they produced a line of guns. Again, Daisy bought them out about 1904, produced the guns for a year or so, then closed down the production and moved whatever equipment and things they wanted to Plymouth. Um, Helprin, this is quite an ornate gun. As you can see, it has a, a number of designs molded into the casting. And uh, I don't know how long Helpern was in the business, but I know uh, back at least in the 50s or so, Helpern was producing cap pistols and holster sets at that time. The Bijou rifle here, which you see, that was produced by the Plymouth Air Rifle Company, which was the company that Hamilton actually started when he left the windmill company. Uh, when he left, the windmill company and started his own company, the Plymouth Air Rifle Company. Of course, we pointed out earlier that he then designed the all-metal Daisy and he went back to Daisy and was a supervisor there until 1898. Now, he didn't close his factory down. His son ran that factory 
uh, until about 1894 when it mysteriously burnt down. I think someone that was a suggestion that they were somebody was getting rid of some of the competition in town. But anyway, Mr. Hamilton stayed at the Daisy Company until uh, 1898, uh, and he left and then started another company, and he started producing the Hamilton 22, which was built in Plymouth uh, up through the the 30s and probably I think he died in that period of time and then his family uh, kept it going until World War II broke out and then they later sold the gun uh, the, the business to another gentleman I think was named Hoban that produced the line uh, after after World War II but of course I think it probably ceased by the 50s. With the tremendous success that uh, Daisy had uh, right around the 1890s, 1900s, um, there was a gentleman came and visited him just shortly after the turn of the century and said that he was coming out with a new invention and with the success that Mr. Huff and Mr. Bennett had, uh, he actually wanted uh, them to run his new company that he was going to start. So they t talked with him for a while and of course they had gone through the lean times and now they were uh, going through the good times. And so they decided that they didn't want to do that and so they told him no thanks. Uh, a little later he came back again and told them that he would build his company in Plymouth, Michigan if they would run it. Again they talked it over, decided that they didn't want to do that. Things were going too good here and so they just didn't want to do it. And, but Mr. Bennett did agree to buy, I think it was around 5,000 shares of stock that this gentleman was selling. So instead of building his company in Plymouth, Michigan, Henry went down to Dearborn, Michigan and started the Ford Motor Company. I mentioned previously about um, uh, Mr. Markham from the Markham Air Rifle Company. Of course, once uh, he started uh, making money with his uh, air gun, uh, I think he ended up buying a boat that he had around on one of the rivers or lakes around there. And uh, so he uh, bought an old captain's hat and he would wear that and referred to himself as Captain Markham. Um, later, he wanted to, to leave Plymouth and uh, so he contacted uh, Mr. Huff and Mr. Bennett and wanted to know if they were interested in buying um, his company. So Mr. Huff and Mr. Bennett talked it over and uh, they decided to go ahead and buy the, uh, the Markham company uh, on their own, not through Daisy. So this happened in 1912. Um, they kept the company in their name until I think around the late 30s when they actually sold it to Daisy. But I'm going to tell you a little story about Mr. Markham uh, that I usually tell. And um, in the early days when he was there, uh, he had a family, a wife that uh, was the head of the temperance league. Uh, she was not a very uh, beautiful woman. Anyway, he had hired a new secretary, a blonde, young blonde secretary named Blanche. And eventually, uh, he wanted to divorce his wife. Uh, but being Catholic, she would not give him a divorce. And so, Mr. Markham built a home for Blanche it was right downtown in Plymouth, beautiful two, three-story house with stained glass windows, all fenced in with wrought iron at the top, had it almost like an enclosed park in the back with a pool and deer. And uh, Blanche lived right across the street, and so all the town mothers looked down on, of course, Mr. Markham and Blanche. 
And uh, in fact, they would throw stones every time they walked by the house. They would throw stones at the window, so he eventually just put wood or plywood up in front of the windows to keep them from getting broke. Well, his wife decided to move to Detroit, and so he bought her a house down there, and she went down there and lived. Later, she died, and of course then, uh, Mr. Markham was uh, married Blanche. But uh, things didn't change as far as the town people because of the way they had lived beforehand. And uh, consequently, this was why Mr. Markham decided to leave and sell his company. He took his money and went to California with Blanche and bought a good deal of property there. And uh, in the early teens, he was contacted by some gentlemen that were starting a new business. And I sort of show it like this. It was the movie industry and the land that Mr. Markham sold them turned out to be Hollywood later on. And as they would say, that's the rest of the story. He did live in a beautiful mansion like the stars used to live in, and I think he lived until probably the late 30s when he died. When Mr. Huff and Mr. Bennett uh, bought the Markham Company, uh, they were producing at that time a, a, a rifle which they called the New King, uh, they had a number of guns, and of course you can see they were going with metal and wood stocks. Uh, the name of the company was then called King, and of course Daisy kept that name in their line. They produced that line of guns, the King line, uh, up until about 19, uh, the late, I think about time of World War II. And at that time, uh, they can closed it down, of course, because there was no production during World War II of guns, and um, they just kept whatever equipment that they wanted, and then ended up using the Markham plant strictly for storage facilities. Take a look at some of our later model guns in this display. At the top, you see a 1905 Decker, uh, made by the Decker Manufacturing Company in Detroit, Michigan. Another gun here we have is um, uh, one built by the Dubar Company, of course, was then later bought out by Daisy. Uh, then we have a 1908 Model A uh, repeater, uh, 1911. This is an experimental gun uh, built by a gentleman. It was a homemade model. Uh, his name was William Hawthorne. Uh, this particular gun is, was a handmade model by Charles Lefevre. This was a, a 1911 gun, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Mr. Lefevre in a few minutes. Uh, we have a 1911 Daisy Model B1000, 1912 single shot, and a 1912 Model C, very rare gun, only produced about two years. In 1912, uh, Mr. Lefevre contacted Mr. Huff at Daisy and uh, indicated that he had a pump BB gun and would we be interested in it. And so Mr. Huff went down to uh, St. Louis to see him. And this is sort of what he showed him. This was the gun that uh, Mr. Lefevre had designed and worked on, and in this was in 1912. Uh, at that time, Mr. Huff decided that he wanted to con uh, have him move to Plymouth, Michigan and put this gun into production, do the tooling work and everything. Uh, Mr. Lefevre said he would come and set up the tooling and that, but he wasn't going to go to work for Daisy. Uh, so he came to Plymouth in 1912. This was one of his 19, this was, this was an experimental model from 1913. So now we're getting pretty close to what the production daisy was going to look like. This particular model is the 1914 model, and this was basically the model which was introduced to the public at that time. The gun sold for $5. 
It was a top line BB gun with a pump action, um, had a, an adjustable front sight. That was changed after about two years because I think the youngsters probably ended up losing them because you could slide them back and forth and they would lose them. Another feature of the pump, uh, and I'll show you on a different model, was that you could take the gun down. So if you were going to travel or something, you just unscrew it like that, pull it apart, and so you had two small pieces that were fit in a case. And actually, uh, when uh, they marketed the gun in the uh, 30, early 30s, this was the type of box they sold it in. And of course, the gun was in a takedown mode. Uh, over here we have a number of other guns. The first one up here is a 1914 Daisy uh, Model H, which uh, was modified with a dart loader. Uh, on the bottom of that, that actually would pull down, and I think we spoke earlier about darts that were produced by the Quackenbush Company, and that's how you inserted that dart into the gun so that you could shoot it out. Uh, we have a 1927 uh, Model 27. Uh, we have another experimental gun that was designed uh, by Mr. Lefevre. This was in 1916, still working off the sort of 25 style gun. Uh, in 1916, we came out with a gun that Mr. Lefevre had designed. Uh, actually, you see here, it's called our Model 40 but it was sort of a replica of the old 03 Springfield rifle World War I gun. Uh, actually also was designed with a bayonet, which you see over here. Most parents would take these off of the guns. They had rubber tips, but this was all metal. They would take those uh, bayonets and probably put them away. Most of the people that find these guns nowadays will find them without the bayonets. The bayonets are a rare piece. These bayonets will bring $500 or more just for the bayonet and about another $500 to $1,000 for the guns with the slings. I had talked earlier about this modified uh, Daisy Model H, which uh, was modified to shoot the uh, Quackenbush dart. And of course, this loaded on the bottom, and by pulling this lever forward and pulling it down, you actually could put the dart right in that barrel and then close it. Uh, a number of daisies could shoot those darts, but probably the most popular guns were the brake barrel pellet guns that would uh, use that same dart. Uh, this is another experimental Model 25 that Mr. Lefevre worked on. Uh, of course, the original shot tube you screwed out and put 50 BBs in. It was a force feed tube, but this one was designed. Uh, he was uh, designing a top loading system on it with putting the spring on the top of the barrel, which was doing everything that the shot tube did that you put in here. But I, I think it, it fell through because they stayed with the regular force feed tube on the Model 25. Uh, probably the biggest change that was made in the 25 model uh, came along in about 1929, 1930, when they went from a short cocking lever and a straight stock to a longer cocking lever with a pistol grip stock. In 1936 then, they also went to uh, gold filled engraving on the stock, and that's probably what most people remember, because that came out in 36 and was produced from 36 to early 42 when all production ceased on our guns because of World War II. After the war, they came back and produced this through 1950. Uh, and then in 51, they actually started putting plastic on the Model 25. The 25 stayed in our line and was one of our most popular guns uh, until 1978, and that's when the model was dropped from the line. Okay, in this particular display, we have uh, toy guns. 
Uh, these guns either were just noise-making guns, cork guns, uh, squirt guns, toys of that nature. They didn't shoot BBs. They were all little toy guns. Uh, some of the first Daisy toy guns were produced uh, just about 1908, 1909, and you see different guns, along with guns produced by other companies, too, as you see here. Um, a number of these, of course, were designed by Mr. Lefevre, who did the Model 25 and the Model 40. Uh, he had uh, squirt guns, pop guns. Uh, there was the Buck Rogers was a famous gun uh, that Cass worked on, and uh, that was introduced in 34. Uh, was an instant success. Gun originally sold for 50 cents, and now they'll bring upwards of $1,000. But most of the kids grew up with little squirt guns, toy guns, pop guns that were produced by Daisy. In 1953, uh, Cass was working with uh, our people and came out with a noise-making gun only that was built on our small BB gun frame. Here you'll see a model 960 and then uh, also a model we called the 1938. Over the years, we built a version, many versions of the noise-making gun uh, from 1953 all the way up to 2000 when they dropped uh, that series of guns. They were used uh, first to uh, teach safe gun handling to young children. Uh, they could be used and not have to worry about shooting BBs. They were also used in areas where uh, BB guns were restricted. But it did make a first gun, a good first gun for training youngsters. And then they would, since it was built on a BB gun frame, then they could graduate to the BB gun uh, and then up through the line. Uh, over here, actually, you see a sort of a hodgepodge of various type toys. Uh, Daisy, in order to expand their toy line, introduced a line of um, uh, battery-operated toys that were built in Japan. This was during the 60s. They had racing sets. They had walkie-talkies. They had little toy radios. Uh, but those were other items that were not made by us at our factory, but were produced overseas. This particular gun is sort of interesting. This is just a prototype here because it's out of clear plastic. The production guns were either made out of a sort of a red or yellow plastic or camouflage. Uh, it just used regular rolls of paper, no caps involved, and when you put them in the gun and fired that, they would pop just like a cap but it was a paper popper. We had that out for a few years back in the early 60s. Here I'd like to point out an item that's of interest is the Jack Armstrong flying top from 1936. Um, we'll show you in a few minutes an ad covering this pistol and the museum didn't have anything on it at that time other than the ad. And, um, a few years ago, a gentleman came in and he was looking at the ad and he said, well, I've got two of those. He says, do you have any? And I said, no. And he says, well, I'm going to donate one to the museum. And um, so uh, he sent us this pistol along with the two flying tops. This was a thing that was designed by uh, Cass. You can see this right here. That was advertising. And when you put that spinning top on it, you wound it up and there was a spring in there. And then, of course, when you fired it, it looked just like a helicopter going up in the air. And they, uh, those were sold as a premium through uh, Wheaties. And of course, it was, uh, you sent in a box top and 25 cents and you ended up with one of those flying tops. During the uh, actually teens and early 20s, uh, Daisy used uh, regular people, including actually uh, Teddy Roosevelt and some of their ads. Uh, up here we have an ad with uh, a former Olympic member, uh, Major John Heisen, talking with youngsters about shooting air guns. When, when we got to the 30s, there was a transition where we came out with a number of toy guns that didn't actually do anything. Some of them shot water, but probably one of the most popular was this disintegrator, which uh, Cass Huff had designed, talked to Dick Calkins, who drew the Buck Rogers line, and talked him into putting this in his comic strips. So you'll see the gun is actually featured in the comic strips. Later, Cass uh, 
got together with the R.H. Uh, Macy Company up in New York and showed them the gun. They were very interested in it, and they got a lot of uh, costumes and stuff from the movies of that period of time and built a display up. They wanted uh, exclusive distributorship for a few months on this gun if they put it out. When Mr. Huff talked to uh, Mr. his dad and Mr. Bennett about this, uh, they sort of scoffed at the idea of about coming out with this toy gun. It did nothing but pop, and it had a lighter flint in the top, which would spark and, and light up a red plastic lens in that top of this gun. That gun, actually, that was a turret of a space machine back then, or a flying saucer, if you'd want to call it later on. Anyway, they introduced this in 1934. And uh, I think Cass had the last laugh about that because that first year they sold over a million of those pistols. Uh, they came out with a complete line of accessories and uh, built that gun uh, through the uh, early 40s, stopped production, of course, because of World War II. And then after the war, they still built uh, the disintegrator although that first model was copper-plated, the later ones uh, were blued. I might add that this 50-cent pistol, along with our super-liquid helium squirt gun, sold for 50 cents. These guns will now bring upwards of $1,000. As I mentioned previously, uh, Charles Bennett was hired in 1891 as Daisy's first salesman. Uh, after the turn of the 20th century, uh, Charlie started uh, handling export uh, for Daisy. And of course, the Chinese market was just opening up at that time. So Charlie uh, went over there, wanted to um, see what he could do about selling guns. And of course, they told him they didn't think he could ever get a gun into China. So he went to see, uh, get an audience with one of the local mandarins there. And uh, to show that the guns weren't dangerous, Mr. Bennett actually cocked the gun and gave it to the mandarin, stepped about 20 feet away and bent over and told him to shoot, shoot me. And so he did. And then he shot him again. <laughs> and, and I don't think Charlie was expecting that second and maybe third shot that he got. And of course, he didn't want to show that it hurt. But anyway, he did get an order and got guns into China at that time. This particular gun here was one that Charlie took, on, uh, took with him on his tour around the world selling guns. And that was back in 1906, 1907. So this gun is marked especially and is in this display here. But I think it was a few days before Charlie ever got to sit down because he just couldn't do it. As you will note, this gun is inscribed, Charles H. Bennett of Plymouth, Michigan, took this air rifle around the world as a sample in 1906-1907, presented to PBB February 1907. Is this the gun the Mandarin used? Nobody really knows. Because of the popularity of the Red Rider, we decided to make up a separate display uh, showing the guns from the time they started out through our 50th anniversary model. Uh, I had mentioned previously about the Red Rider being introduced in 1940. And of course, some of the features of that gun were the copper bands, as you see here, uh, the uh, ring and staple with a leather thong, and of course the Red Rider name spelled out by a, le uh, a lariat with Red Rider on the horse. Uh, one of the uh, other features of this gun when it was introduced was it a w was a 1,000 shot Daisy air rifle. This gun was produced from 1940 until mid-1942. Of course, uh, World War II broke out on December 7th of 41, and uh, Daisy produced the guns until they ran out of material. After the war was over, uh, they resumed production, but at that time there were some changes made in the gun. 
uh, these copper bands were now blued. Uh, that was done basically because this band was welded to the barrel, whereas on the original it was a slip fit. So they welded it. Otherwise, it was basically the same as the original gun. They produced it that way. And of course, uh, one other point or feature I would point out, these guns had cast iron levers. Uh, in 1947, they changed uh, to a die-cast aluminum letter, which was painted black. And that, was, that change was made in 47. The gun was produced up through 1949. And in 1950, there was a change made in the material used for daisy guns on their stocks and forearm. The Red Rider was the first gun that Daisy introduced with a molded or plastic stock. Now, when we first introduced the gun in 1950, we had a surplus of wooden stocks. So rather than just scrap them out, they used a wooden stock on the gun with a plastic forearm. And this is referred to as a transition model. Once those stocks, wooden stocks, were used up, then, of course, they had full plastic. Once we had the plastic stocks, uh, then the gun was produced with a plastic stock and forearm. Uh, that was in 52, once we passed the, the transition model. Now, in 53, there was a difference uh, in the guns in the fact that uh, in July of 1953, Daisy went from bluing their guns to electrostatic painting their guns. And this gun has a painted finish. Uh, at that time, we were putting a, a painted finish on our guns that was far superior to anything that was being used in the automobile industry at that time. They were using the old spray methods. And Daisy was using the latest electrostatic process. And uh, those guns sold anywhere from $2 to $7. Now, 1953 was the last year that we produced the model number 111, model 40, Red Rider. Uh, as I mentioned, the transition model, we used up our wood stocks. And if you'll note on the wood stock, of course, uh, they had the uh, signature of Fred Harmon, actually uh, a representative of Red, representing Red Rider with a horse and spelling out with a lariat the name Red Rider. Then, in 1950, when we switched over to the plastic stock, uh, it was basically the same, except we didn't have him sp spelling out Red Rider with a lariat. But you can see uh, Red Rider on his horse with the name Red Rider on the stock. From the time Daisy was uh, started production of their guns, they had their own wood working shops uh, for producing all of their stocks. All of the stocks were made from wood at that time and done actually at the Plymouth plant. Now, in 1950, uh, when we started with the plastic stocks, they were actually built for us by a company called Modern Plastics Corporation. They were loaded, uh, located in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Uh, after we moved to Arkansas, in fact, they came down and set up our plastics department, and Daisy has started producing just plastic stocks here. Later, when we decided to add wood back to some of our guns, since we didn't have the uh, facilities for producing the wood stocks, we purchased our wood stocks that were, they were built outside for us. Uh, in 1954, we came out with a brand new uh, Red Rider, the Model 94. It had a number of special features. As you'll see, the sight was uh, much more elaborate than the original sight. Uh, they went back to putting a forearm band on the gun, which was left off on the models produced after the war. This was a special uh, sort of silver band with Indian markings on it. They put a new uh, flip sight on there that we had. It was an open sight or a peep sight. Uh, they put uh, a silk screen on the gun which included the initials RR for Red Rider, uh, the hot stamp, which had the model number along with the name Red Rider, and this special leather boot. So this was a pretty good jazzed up version 
uh, and it, it was another very successful gun. In 1957, Fred Harmon quit drawing the Red Rider character at the end of 57, and so since there was no, nothing else out there to relate the gun to, it was decided to drop the gun. Uh, that happened in at the end of 1957. Now the Model 94 was produced past that time for about four or five more years, but we call it, we referred to it as the Model 94 Western Carbine rather than the Red Rider. In 1972, uh, there was a nostalgia kit going on in the country, and uh, because of the popularity of the Red Rider, we decided to reintroduce it. Now, we still had the dies, of course, uh, for this gun, and this was the model we brought back, which was very similar to the original gun we were producing up here. Same loading features, uh, the blued bands, the leather thong, and of course the Red Rider stamp on the stock. The way we advertised it was, ask Dad, he had one, all right? Dad could tell you who Red Ryder was. Now we produced that gun through 1978. Uh, 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 there was a change made in 78, and if you'll notice, on this gun, the Red Rider is on the opposite side of the stock compared to the other guns. That was done basically for packaging purposes. Mostly before that, the guns were put in boxes, so it didn't make any difference. But we went to uh, what we call a rack item, which was a gun put on a card that was in shrink wrap with clear wrapping, and that particular gun was displayed from left to right. And so when this the, hot, the, the, the Red Rider was designed in the other gun, it wouldn't show. So they reversed it, and then the packages were like that. Those packages could be hung, they would stand or stack on a shelf. And they did still have boxes, but the stamp was changed at that time. That's one of the things the collectors note right off the bat. Now, in 19... 79, we made a, a big change on our guns. Um, the government wanted us to change our loading procedures. They did not like uh, shot tubes that could be removed from the gun and put back by the kids, uh, because if they didn't screw them in properly, it, they possibly could fly out. So we re redesigned our guns so that they had non-removable shot tubes and all you did was open a little loading port on the side of the gun to put the BBs in. So the secondary barrel, which is where these BBs actually loaded on these other guns, was just, is now just a dummy barrel, and you put your BBs in there. Another good safety feature, though, was the cross-bolt safety, which was put on the gun at that time. Now, uh, to, to produce that gun, we had to somehow denote a difference between it and the standard 1938, so we called this the 1938B. That way, if somebody ordered parts for a Red Rider, we knew which model they wanted the parts for. Uh, collectors of uh, air guns are always looking for unusual features, and there are a few things I would like to point out. On the Red Rider back in about 1941, the die that was used to mark the stock with Red Rider, I think, was broken. And uh, so they ended up painting the stocks with a Red Rider, a picture of Red Rider on it. That happened for a month or two, I guess, until they got uh, the die fixed back up and we're back into production. Now that, of course, we don't have one of those on display. And if there's anybody out there that has one that would like to donate uh, to the Rogers uh, Daisy Museum, we'd be more than happy to accept it. Uh, another thing that I had talked about was when we went to the, uh, what I call B gun, originally uh, this was done, we had to change the name so that once anybody ordered parts we could distinguish the difference between the various guns. And so we did use A. And what happened was uh, when we got it out, we found we had a problem with the trigger. And so uh, we issued a recall and pulled the guns back 
and uh, we'd already designed a new trigger for the gun. And so when the guns were sent out, we put a B on the gun after the A. So everything that had been in service properly was called the AB gun. Uh, if we had any barrels or anything that were ready to go out, rather than scrap them, they just marked the gun AB. Once those were all used up, then we went to the letter B and put it on the gun. And that number, of course, is still used. These are referred to as the 1938B, and it's still in production. In 1983, uh, MGM was going to come out with a movie uh, that had, was a compilation of stories written by Gene Shepard. Uh, I think the original story was called, In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. Uh, for some reason, they didn't think that was a good name for, uh, for the story of a lot of little boy wanting a BB gun for Christmas. So they changed it to a Christmas story. Now, uh, in getting ready to uh, make the movie, they were going to have to have some guns on hand. Earlier, we had talked about the change when we came out with the B guns. Well, what we had to do is to go back and produce or use a gun from the period that, uh, uh, like the original Red Riders. And of course, in 1972, we had this model uh, what we called the 1938. About the only difference between it and the original gun was that we had a painted finish, but that wouldn't show in the movie. But one big feature was the original gun had copper bands. So what I did, uh, since these bands were welded on here, uh, I went and got some uh, automobile engine paint, copper in color, from the local uh, auto accessory store, I masked the guns off and painted these bands copper. Well, that took care of that. Then we ran into a problem because Mr. Shepard didn't remember it quite the way I think it was. He said, my Daisy Red Rider had a compass and a sundial. Well, the Red Rider was never produced with a compass and sundial. Okay, Buck Jones was a famous movie a uh, cowboy star back during the uh, 30s and early 40s. This was a rifle we put out with Buck's name on it. Uh, some of the features uh, was this was a pump, but it was a straight back pump which worked like this. And it also had his name engraved on it and a compass and sundial. Now this is what Mr. Shepard remembered as a young boy as having a compass and a sundial, but he said it was on his Red Rider. Well, it never was on the Red Rider, but in order to satisfy him, we went ahead and made up a gun with that on it. This was the gun that we produced. Uh, it was one of about two or three guns that were used as prop guns in the movie. And as you can see, we have a compass and a sundial. I had uh, had one of the original Buck Jones stocks. We made a uh, negative of this and produced a silk screen to give us this sundial. Uh, went out and looked around town and finally found a compass that we were able to use on the stock and produce this along with three or four other guns. And of course, the other feature that I pointed out were the copper bands. Of course, they don't look too copper now, but. I actually used uh, automobile engine copper colored paint to paint these bands so that they would be copper and look like the original Red Rider from 1940. Okay, once the uh, movie A Christmas Story came out in the fall of 1983, uh, this was one of the original uh, movie posters from the story, along with a stand-up card that went in the, um, probably in the concession stand inside the movie. Uh, this is not the original leg lamp, but is a reproduction of the leg lamp that was uh, in the movie. 
We also see a little picture of uh, Ralphie, of course, with his uh, cowboy outfit and his uh, Daisy Red Rider. Uh, because uh, the movie was coming out in the fall, Daisy thought that they probably ought to take advantage of it and uh, come out with a Christmas Story gun. Uh, I had pointed out previously that the current guns at that time uh, were designed with non-removable shot tubes. This was the gun we used in the original movie, which was like the original gun. Uh, so what we did was take the current uh, model Red Rider, which was a 1938 B gun, and uh, fix it up with a gold band and a compass and sundial on the opposite side. And that uh, was sold in the latter part of 1983 and all of 1984. And uh, we do have collectors that contact me wanting to know about the authenticity of their guns. Uh, we can tell from the production dates whether they fell within that period range or not. Uh, sometimes we did have a number of these stocks left over and over a period of time people bought them and they would put them on the, uh, their gun and of course the only difference would be that number on the gun otherwise it looked exactly like the production Christmas Story gun. Okay, over here we have a, a, a number of daisies on display. Uh, a few of these guns are from the 20s, uh, otherwise we get into the, basically into the 30s and 40s. Uh, you see a few experimental models that were made for us on the outside. But uh, one of the guns uh, I had mentioned earlier about um, Buzz Barton, and I, I mentioned that he was a teenage uh, movie star and rodeo star. Um, actually, this when we first come out with those guns, we had... Um, paper labels on them, such as you see on this gun. This was a uh, 34 model, one of the early models, was nickel plated, and it used a paper label of that at that time. It was a model 195. Later they stopped using the paper because you can see what happens to it. It can deteriorate and fall off. Uh, again, here's a later model with blue, but you can see that that sort of been the Buzz Barton was burned into the stock. The model that we have here was actually one of the first Buzz Bartons back in 1932, and it's what we refer to as a cutaway model, so that you can look at the internal parts to see how actually a spring-operated gun actually operated. Um, when you cock the gun, this spring is compressed, as you see now. Uh, it, the plunger case is engaged by the trigger. You have an air tube here, which fits in the back of the shot tube. There's a small retainer spring here that kept the BBs from rolling out of the barrel. And when you fired the gun by pulling the trigger, this spring would slam forward, and the air that was trapped in this area here would go into this tube through an opening at the top, and as this slammed forward, it moved all the way here, pushed the BB past the retainer, and the air that flowed through this tube is what propelled the BB out. You can also see a cutaway of the, the actual sights that they used on those guns. They were basically a tube sight. They call them, um, like it could almost be a telescope, but there were no lenses in them. And uh, they were used on all of the Buzz Barton guns during that period of time. One of the other guns that came out shortly thereafter was our Model 50, which was the 50th anniversary Golden Eagle, represented the 50th anniversary of Daisy at that time. The gun, as you can see, is copper plated. It had a black painted stock with a special Golden Eagle medallion on it with the dates 1886 to 1936, Golden Eagle. Very popular gun, especially with collectors. This particular model was called our number 108. It was introduced uh, in 1939. Uh, when we first came out with it, uh, the gun actually had been built by the King Company, of course, which uh, Daisy owned. This was a model they put out, and if you know some of the special features was that it had a curved stock, curved cocking lever, and it had what they called, uh, actually, 
a lightning loader shot tube. The regular Daisy gravity feed guns had just a small hole that was just slightly larger than a BB, and it was very awkward to put these BBs in there. But with the lightning loader feature, you just turned a shot tube, poured the BBs down into this tube, they went from there right down into the main barrel of the gun and could hold uh, a large amount of BBs. Most of our guns had anywhere from 350 all the way up to 1,000 shots. When they first introduced this gun in January of 1939, they called it the Lone Scout. Uh, after about three months, we got a letter from the uh, Boy Scouts of America saying that was a name that was one of their scouting groups uh, that actually started in 1915 and we would not be able to use that term on the gun. So what we did was send a letter out to all the dealers that we had shipped guns to for those first three months and sent them labels to put on the boxes and at that time we changed the gun and called it the number 108 model 39 lightning loader. And so uh, that advertisement hit about uh, May of 1939. So there are guns out there, and of course collectors really prize it if they can find that 108 Lone Scout gun, and, and it actually was only built for about a three month period at the, at the beginning of 1939. Continuing on, a couple of these guns that you see at the top were experimental models that were produced uh, uh, but never, of course, met production. A gun that I would like to show you is this particular one here. It was called the 140 Defender. Uh, production was planned on this gun in um, late December of 1941. Uh, just about the time they were going to get into production, Pearl Harbor was bombed, and I had mentioned previously that once our materials ran out, we ceased production of all our guns. Well, they produced probably this gun for about two months, and I think there was around 35,000 approximately of these guns built. This gun, of course, was considered rare because it was only produced for about three months. And uh, I would say that uh, most collectors aren't aware of this, but that gun probably goes uh, in the four to eight hundred dollar range, depending on the um, condition of the gun. Uh, after the war, when Daisy resumed production, uh, that gun was not included in it. And the main reason was because of the shortage of material. You could. Uh, you must remember that we were located in Plymouth, Michigan at that time. We were surrounded by the automobile industry, and during the war, the automobile industry was not building cars. So once the war was over, uh, they were gobbling up all the steel, and we sort of got what was left over. So we weren't even able to produce a full line of guns as, such as we had back in 1941. So we produced just four models, the Model 102, the Model 155, the Model 25 pump gun, which you saw before, earlier, and of course the Red Rider. Those were the four most popular guns. So it was 1948 before we actually got back into full production, uh, producing what we had produced prior to the war, with the exception of the Model 140. Even That even included our Model 118 BB pistol which was Daisy's first BB pistol and introduced in 1937. Uh, after the war, we finally brought the gun back in 1949. Uh, the original gun was blued and then we came out with a nickel-plated gun with a plastic spinner target in it, which also held two tubes of the special BBs that this pistol used, these little metal tubes, red, white, blue tubes. They're collectibles also, but they fit right into the bottom display of the of the that held the pistol, the plastic display, and was also served as a target for the gun. Uh, the plastic target, the little red plastic target that was used in our, it was actually called the number 320 set that, it, that we introduced in 1949. Uh, we don't, as you can see, we don't have one on display here. In fact, I think we made a yellow one for Sears, but um, 
we, uh, if anybody has one out there that they wouldn't mind donating to the museum, we would be more than happy to uh, uh, put it on display and, of course, put a, a plaque on it indicating who donated it. But that was part of the history of that pistol, and, of course, it was Daisy's first BB pistol. Uh, this gun I'm going to show you next is fairly unique. If you look at it, of course, it looks just like a double barrel shotgun with the but it is really a double barrel BB gun. Uh, Daisy was going to introduce this in 39. It actually came out in their 39 catalog, but they probably got into production in the latter part of 1938. And so they started selling them. This gun sold for five dollars at that time. It was the double barrel. It actually had two plungers and two shot screws from the Model 25 pump gun. The gun operated by throwing the lever, cocking it. Of course, you can see it takes a little bit of strength to do. It had safeties, and of course, when you threw the safety off, uh, you could fire the gun. The bulk of these guns, the sales, and there were only about 40 about 45,000 sold in a three-year period. And I think that the problem was, like you just saw in me cocking this gun, these guns were designed for youngsters, and yet it took a lot of power to cock the gun. So I think the sales that first year were about like 33,000, and then they dropped down to about 8,000 and then down to around 2,000 or so. So he ended up overall with approximately 45,000 guns built uh, when they uh, discontinued it at, at the end of 1940. A very popular gun. These guns in, uh, uh, will bring probably anywhere from 1,000 to $1,500 or more on the uh, resale market. Very popular. Now, after Daisy moved to Arkansas in 1958, in 1960 we came out with what we called spit and image guns, guns that look like real guns. But by 1968, somebody says, well, we have all the equipment to make these double barrels. Since that looks like a real gun, why don't we reintroduce it? So at that time, we came out with two guns our Model 21 double barrel, which you see here, but it was in a special version. Now the original gun uh, that we reintroduced was going to have a plastic stock and forearm. We were coming out with this in early 1968. We had sent sample pictures, and a sample gun actually, to uh, some of our major customers, and one of them was Sears Roebuck. Sears put this in their 1967 Christmas catalog and all of a sudden they were getting orders for the gun and we did not have the plastic dies ready to produce the plastic stocks. So we had a company up in uh, Warsaw, Missouri, uh, the Fajan Company, they were famous stock makers at that time. We had them produce a number of stocks out of wood which we used and put on the Sears gun. Uh, then, of course, these are rare because there were only probably uh, less than 2,000 of them made and sold at that time, and uh, these will bring anywhere from 1000 to $1,500 for this, this gun here. Now, we produced a noise-making version of this gun. It was called the 410. Now, this has the full plastic stock and forearm that we were producing, and this was sort of later on. Uh, this gun, again, uh, operated by breaking it apart, cocking it, throwing off the safety, and firing. Hold your ears. But it was strictly a noisemaker. Uh, in 1970, we discontinued it because, uh, again, this was something that was designed for even younger children than the BB gun, and again, you still had the same problem with trying to cock the gun. So it was produced actually from 68 to 1970, whereas the 21 uh, BB gun was built 
from 1968 through 72. I would like to point out that like any collectible, uh, it more or less comes down to the condition of the item that you're trying to sell or buy and what you're willing to take or somebody's willing to give you. So, you know, these prices that we've, I've quoted will vary as time goes on, too, because they're, everything is going up. The uh, 102 actually came out in 1936 and was produced all the way through 1978. Of course, in 79 is when we made our change to uh, non-removable shot tubes, and the gun that took its place was our uh, number 105 buck which still has a, a wood stock, and of course, it was basically the same as the 102, except for the front sight was a, a little fancier, but it was a, a, a gun that we designed, and of course, it's what we call our B models, that had the non-removable shot tubes. Uh, one of our models that's a little unique, uh, it was an entirely different style, but this was our number 106, which we came out with in 1958. Well, we were still located in Plymouth, and we produced it, uh, the balance of 58 in Rogers, Arkansas, in, in 1959 before it dropped. We dropped it, but it was, it cocked like this. And of course, this shroud covered the cocking mechanism. And then, of course, it fired just like any regular gun. That's the number 106. Uh, in 1960, uh, we had come out with um, a CO2 pistol, and here we have a prototype of a rifle using our 1894 uh, designed for a CO2 system. It was just a prototype and actually never went into production. This particular gun was presented to Kassoff by Chuck White. Chuck was the president of the Modern Plastics Corporation. Uh, they were the people that made our plastic stock for us while we were located in Plymouth. Uh, they were located in uh, Benton Harbor, Michigan. And this was another gun in our Spitten Image line, which we introduced in the early 60s, uh, the Daisy Model 26 pump. It was uh, a slide action pump gun, of course, and it uh, uh, had a BB tube that loaded up here. And you put your BBs in the gun, and of course, then it would fire. Early 60s and 70s uh, was when Daisy really got into what they called their spit and image line. Uh, in other words, look alike of the real gun. The first gun that we produced in this, other than our BB pistol 179, was our 19, 1894 which was similar to this Buffalo Bill gun. It was a replica of the Winchester Model 94. This was a special version we made up with the Buffalo Bill insignia name, and this was produced from 1969 uh, through 1973. Uh, our 1894 was originally introduced in 1961, and I would point out that we actually had three different guns. We had the BB gun, we had a cork ball repeater, the number 894, and a noisemaker version, uh, the number 694. And we produced those for uh, two or three years. I think the cork ball repeater was dropped first, and then versions of our noisemaker were produced uh, probably up until the 90s. The, uh, we make a current version of the 1894, but it's designed with a wooden stock and forearm and the feed mechanism is a little different where we had to change it to meet uh, regulations. Another one of the spit and image models we produced was uh, our model 26, which I showed you earlier. Uh, in 1967, we came out with uh, an update of that gun. It was called the 572, and of course that was a, a pump type BB gun, which loaded up here, and after you loaded it, it cocked like this, and of course, uh, with the safety off, fired like that. Uh, we produced that through, uh, through um, 76, and then that's when we dropped uh, this particular model. 
Another model I want to show you is our model 8670, which we introduced in 1970. Uh, this particular model, uh, the metalwork is pretty well production, but as you'll see by the stock, that, that's a prototype stock made out of solid wood and uh, a very beautiful piece of wood. Of course, the production models uh, had plastic stock and forearm. I might point out that the uh, cocking lever on this gun was sort of a hidden design. I'll, I'll demonstrate it. It actually pulled down like this and cut. So it was actually concealed. But that's, a, um, that's how the gun worked. This is a model, uh, actually one of Daisy's first pellet guns, which we come out was referred to as the Featherlight pellet gun. Uh, it had a unique design and it used a rotary five shot clip. We had uh, what we call a small frame gun like this and a large frame gun that was built on our 90, 99 style. Uh, they produced it probably about four or five years and then eventually dropped it. In 1960, uh, as we were getting into our uh, spit and image line, uh, the first gun that we actually designed was a model 179 BB pistol, which was an exact replica of the Colt 45 Frontier Peacemaker. This particular piece here is a handmade sample, non-production, uh, that was owned by Cass Huff and he donated it to the museum. The production gun, which was made of die cast metal and of course was a working model, was basically like this. It was a, 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 it was a spring gun, but it was not at spring air. Uh, actually, when you cocked it, you pulled the hammer back, you cocked a spring, which actually pulled the spring back, and when you fired the gun, it actually slapped the BB out of the barrel, rather than using air for power. But this gun was in our line, it was used in our spit and image line, our holster line, uh, and was used by a lot of um, gun shooters back then to practice quick draw back in the 60s. Of course, the Westerns were very popular on television. Warner Brother had a whole series of Western uh, movies on TV at that time, and uh, we sold many of these to people that just practiced quick draw. We actually produced this from 1960 through 1985, and um, a little later, uh, we actually got some parts back that had been shipped to Europe, and uh, we produced um, around 700 pistols. We had enough parts to do that and sold them through the museum and uh, they sold out in a matter of about two to three weeks. This gun of course as I said was used a lot for quick draw practice. It, it was only shot out with a velocity of about 125 feet per second so it was a low velocity gun that you could shoot safely indoors or outdoors but it was used a lot for quick draw practice. Okay, next I'd like to show you uh, one of our CO2 pistols. Daisy actually got into the CO2 business in 1962. Up here is an experimental model of our CO2 100, and over here we have the production model of that gun. Uh, this was our first CO2 pistol. Uh, the BBs were loaded into the gun. Um, and shot out in fives. You could put uh, five through at a time. They loaded in the back and then you picked them up with this little tab and you could shoot five shots as fast as you could pull the trigger. Then you would have to flip the tab forward to pick up another five shots. Uh, we decided they wanted to redesign it and make this a little more modern looking. So actually we came out with a new gun in uh, 1963 the CO2-200, and we'll show you that just a little bit later. After we had designed our CO2-200 pistol, after a few years they thought uh, we ought to come out with a rifle. So they took the basic pistol and designed it into a rifle, and we call it our CO2-300. Again, the principle is the same. You just loaded a, a quantity of BBs in the gun and then fed them in with this tab and you could fire five shots as fast as you could pull the trigger. 
Uh, this gun was produced from uh, 1968 through 1975. 1972, Daisy introduced its first pneumatic style gun, uh, the model uh, 880. Uh, this was a very popular gun. We made it in a number of styles, uh, and the gun is still in production today. A pneumatic gun is a gun that you pump up. The more you pump it, the harder it shoots. Uh, that's different than a traditional spring air daisy, which you just cock and fire after one cocking. And of course, your CO2 guns that were built use CO2 for power. Now, we had deluxe version of this gun called the 881. That came out in um, 1977. And you can see it has a sort of a antique silver uh, receiver, special diamond in the black diamond in the forearm. Otherwise, it was still the same basic gun, just a deluxe version of the 880. The pneumatic line is still very popular, and as I said, uh, of course, the 880 is still in production, and we've come out with a, a, a couple of other models. There was the 860 that we brought out in 84, which you see here and also the 856, which you see above. And uh, these are still in production in various versions. Uh, 1988, we came out with another pneumatic gun. Uh, this was called the uh, model uh, 914. And uh, it pumped like this. And of course, fired like that. Uh, actually just in production for about uh, two years, and then they dropped it. The Model 25, which we had seen uh, earlier, uh, was originally designed by Fred Lefevre way back in 1914, and that gun remained in our line all the way up through 1978. This was probably, I think, a 1976 version, and you can see the difference in the stock and the two guns. Uh, this came in in 77. 78, it was a restyle with a Monte Carlo stock. You can see the difference in the grip. And of course, the 25, as we said before, was a pump action gun. Uh, the shot tube you removed put 50 BBs in it. Uh, the gun was, looked like this. And uh, when you cocked it, you just cocked it like this. And of course, fired it like that. Now, uh, in 1979, when we had to make our changes on our guns to meet government regulations, they just didn't feel that making the change and the engineering cost that would be involved on this gun to make that change was worth it. And so the Model 25 was actually dropped at that time. So that gun had been in pr uh, production from 1914 through 78, less World War II. Uh, earlier, I had talked about our number 118 pistol, which we introduced in 1937. That was Daisy's first BB pistol. Uh, it shot the small number 118 size shot. One of the problems that we had was that the dealers didn't like to stock this shot, and so in 1952, we dis discontinued the 118. We worked a redesign and finally come up in 1957 with our model 177, which shot the standard size Daisy BB. The action was very similar to that of the 118, although we used plastic grips on this particular pistol. This set uh, was introduced in 1960, which was a combo which had a holster, BBs, and the pistol itself, and was produced through 1978. As I mentioned previously, Daisy introduced a line of CO2 BB pistols in the early 60s. Uh, they wanted to later expand in the pellet gun business, uh, and Smith & Wesson actually had producing a line of guns in the late 70s, and they wanted to get out of the business, so Daisy bought the, bought the guns out from them. They had two models, the Model 780, which was a 22 caliber pellet gun, the 790, which was basically the same gun, but a 177 caliber gun. Uh, later, we also introduced the Model 41, which was also a model that a target gun, which uh, Smith & Wesson produced, 
and this is of course 177 caliber, but it had special black grips and nickel plating uh, like the original Smith & Wesson. We had these guns in our line uh, through about 1982 and then uh, uh, dropped the line. The uh, third uh, pistol, spring air gun that Daisy designed uh, was the model 188, which we uh, introduced in the um, early 80s. Uh, this cocked by simply pulling this lever down, cocking the gun. Uh, the BBs were dumped into the gun through a loading port. And then, of course, when you closed the mechanism, uh, took off the safe, the gun would fire. Uh, this had a velocity of a, up close to 150 feet per second and was in our line for a number of years through the 80s. I mentioned previously about our Model 118 pistol. That was Daisy's first pistol, but it shot a number 118 size shot. Uh, in 1956, we came out with the new improved version of that gun, which we called the 177, which shot the standard Daisy BB. Uh, we produced that from uh, 1956 all the way through 78. In 1955, uh, Walt Disney came out with the uh, movie Davy Crockett starring Fess Parker, and Daisy was connected with Disney. And uh, we came out with a number of items, including uh, noise making pop guns. That, uh, we had a fringe covered powder horn and also uh, leather covered canteens. This is uh, one of the packages for the uh, powder horn. Uh, one of the sort of unique things about this was on the back side they actually had instructions for mounting the, the cord. Uh, they did not mount that at the factory. They let the customer do that themselves. Actually here is the powder horn with the cord attached. but. Uh, it was good for whatever you wanted to put in it, including BBs. In 1960, we came out with our Model 179 uh, BB pistol. I think you saw a prototype sample of the originals earlier. Uh, this is the actual gun that uh, we came out with. I said this was a, a, a BB shooter. Uh, it would hold approximately 12 BBs. Uh, this was the packaging for the gun. Uh, it was sort of interesting, old western appearance town. And this was a very popular uh, gun. Of course it was part of our first uh, spit and image guns and uh, was used in conjunction with a lot of our fast draw holsters and toy holsters that we produced at that time. Over here we have actually one of the holsters that you could purchase that you could use with that Model 179 or similar cap pistols that were designed like the Colt 45 Frontier Peacemaker. Uh, when we first, Daisy first came here in 1958, we pr started producing our own uh, leather toy holsters and a number of holsters for our BB pistols or our CO2 pistols. And a young lady that came to work for us at that time was named Jan Leach. And Jan worked in our leather department, also designed many of our holsters and did the tooling work on them. This was a holster that was for our model CO2 pistol at that time. And as you can see, it was really it was a top grain holster, all hand tooled. and. Uh, Jan actually made the first set that they made the tooling from to do these holsters with. In the early 60s when we were producing our first line of spit and image guns, uh, there was a gentleman out in California uh, named Arvo Ojala. He uh, produced fast gun, uh, fast gun rigs and uh, this is actually a rig that uh, Daisy produced later after joining with Mr. Ojala. Um, he thought many of the stars, uh, western stars, uh, during the um, 60s when uh, Warner Brothers were producing all the western shows for TV. 
Uh, some of the stars that he taught was Hugh O'Brien from Wyatt Earp, Frank Sinatra, uh, Vic Damone, uh, there was Marilyn Monroe, Clinton Walker, James Arness from Gunsmoke. Mr. Ojala's probably his biggest claim to fame was in the uh, TV show Gunsmoke. Actually, at the beginning of the show, when uh, James Arness came out, he uh, had a gunfight with a gentleman down the street. That gentleman was Mr. Ojala, and of course, James Arness shot him. Um, he received, I think, about $800 for that little episode, but after that, he received residuals on all of the uh, movies when, when they were shown, the Gunsmoke movies, over the years, and it probably is still on some television stations. Uh, Mr. Ojala actually passed away last year. This, uh, when Daisy started producing the Ojala holster, this was uh, our brochures that we had at that time. Um, it actually listed Mr. Ojala's picture with uh, one of our rigs. And uh, as it states here, now Ojala has joined hands with Daisy Manufacturing Company to make this quality, professional, fast draw rig available to the public. Uh, another one of the shows that was very popular during that period of time was Maverick um, with James Garner. And of course, all of these uh, stars back at that time in all of those shows used the uh, Ojala holster. This brochure showed the various rigs that we, we built, uh, how to order them and, and the information we needed. And uh, as you can see on the back, uh, we had uh, five leather finishes, black, natural tan, a rough out, cordovan, and a basket weave. We even had a fast draw uh, instruction book which taught the secrets from Ojala, which you could order from the factory. It was free except 25 cents for postage and handling. In 1962, we came out with our first CO2 pistol, the uh, CO2 100. This was the gun. Um, we made a number of changes in it right off the bat and decided to reintroduce it in 1963 as our CO2 200. Uh, we, I might hold both of these up where you can see some of the differences. You can see where the loading mechanism was on the original 100. The 200, we cleaned the barrel up and just put the loading mechanism down on the side of the trigger. This gun remained in our line until about 1970, uh, the mid-70s. Okay, we had show, uh, mentioned before about producing various holsters. With this, this was an actually a pistol blanket, which was designed for our CO2 pistols. Of course, it had uh, Daisy embossed on the uh, front of it, and of course, the back had a belt loop where you could actually hook it on your belt. It's one of the many options we offered accessories for our CO2 guns during the 60s and 70s. This uh, was a, a new venture for Daisy. We were contacted by a gentleman uh, named Mr. Nelson out of Ironwood, Michigan. Uh, that was in the Upper Peninsula. Actually, he produced, uh, had a paint factory and up there when the um, loggers cut the logs down and sent the logs down to the mills, uh, they used to have to get out on the logs and mark them uh, with some paint to distinguish the various uh, companies that were sending them down. He had an idea of uh, putting uh, paint in a capsule, but he needed a way to propel it, and he had approached Daisy around 1970-71 about producing a paintball gun that would perform this feat that he needed. Uh, so uh, Daisy took a look at it. Since we were in the CO2 business, um, we gave the uh, job to one of our uh, men in engineering, Jay Hale. And Jay worked out and worked this gun up for Mr. Nelson and it became the number 007 nail spot paint pistol. Um, 
They used it for marking logs at that time, but uh, then uh, Game and Fish uh, Commission people started using them for marking animals that maybe got into areas where they weren't supposed to be, so they could just mark them by shooting with a paintball gun. Uh, forestry people started using them for marking trees that had to be taken out. And then later on, a group of uh, enterprising individuals decided to start paintball games. And uh, so uh, we actually were the first with the first paintball gun. Uh, we didn't, uh, we would sell the parts for them to use to produce their guns. And then later uh, they started having uh, paintball guns produced overseas. Uh, and of course it was quite the rage for many years. Still, still is going, but I don't think maybe quite as uh, strong as it was in the past. In 1968, uh, Daisy came out with a, a gun they referred to as a quick skill. If you look at this, you might notice something a little different. Uh, first, you'll notice that it has no sights at all on the gun. Also, the stock is uh, really an adult size stock, uh, not designed for young shooters, but adults. Uh, this gun was used to teach instinct shooting. Um, that means shooting without aiming. The government actually used these guns to train our servicemen going to Vietnam uh, to learn to shoot instinctively because of the type of warfare that was being fought over there. You were in the jungles and of course you did not have time to aim or anything like this. You had to instinctively be able to turn and fire. Uh, with the training with this program, you could actually get, of course this wasn't at long distances, but short distances, you could toss uh, pennies into the air, even aspirins. These guys could develop and hit those targets instinctively without aiming. Um, our, our standard version that we produced for the con uh, consumer at home uh, was used a lot by uh, shotgun shooters, uh, skeet shooters of, of this type. Uh, but they could develop their skills practicing with this and then, of course, going out shooting the real thing. We produced this for the, the government, though, uh, all during the Vietnam War. The next gun I'm going to uh, show you is actually referred to as our VL rifle. Uh, we came out with this gun in 1968, but probably three, four, five years before, Cass Huff uh, was over in Europe and heard about a gentleman that had a different type of power system, and uh, he found him. His name was Jules Van Langenhoven, and at that time he would take a, a break barrel gun and put a pellet in it and put a little piece of dirty cotton in behind the pellet, close it, and fire it depending on how much of this chemical that he put on it would depend on the velocity he would shoot. And you could shoot any uh, desired velocity you wanted from say, say 500 feet per second up to maybe two or 3,000 feet per second. Uh, Cass thought that was something, but it couldn't be developed and sold like that. Uh, it was too much of a, a gimmick at that point. And so, uh, he had Mr. Van Langenhoven come over to Daisy and uh, to develop uh, an ammunition that could be used safely in a gun. Uh, by 1968, we had a solid propellant, and that is what you see here in this block. This is what it looked like, a 29-grain bullet, which is a standard 22, with a solid propellant attached to it. When you put that propellant or cartridge in this gun, it actually cocked like this, which opened the breech. And at that time, we went and designed a single shot. The single shot pellet was put in there. You closed the gun, cocked it, and fired it. Now, when that was fired, the air from this gun, when it was fired, actually ignited that pellet 
and it would go out of the gun basically like a rocket, but it didn't have a glow or anything. It went off just like a 22. Uh, the propellant uh, could only be fired in this gun. If you hit it with a hammer on a cement sidewalk, you had a pile of dust. If you lit it with a cigarette or a, a, a match, uh, it was just smolder down in your hand. Uh, the only way to ignite it was in this gun using air power, which is concentrated on the back of the gun. Uh, as I said, we introduced this in 1968 after a number of years of development. Uh, in 1968, of course, there was two uh, things that happened that changed the course of uh, the production of this gun. Uh, the first was the assassination of Martin Luther King, and the second, of course, the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Uh, because of those assassinations, the government came out with what was called the 1968 gun laws at that time. They were much uh, stricter. Uh, anybody that we sold to had to have a firearms license. Uh, you had to record all of that information. You had to even record the sale of 22 ammunition, which the VL ammo fell into. Um, this was just before you were getting into the computer lines, so it meant a lot of additional work to keep track, uh, track of all of these records. And because this was such a small segment of our gun, uh, business, uh, they decided to drop it after all of that work spent on the development. So the gun actually was sold just in two years, 68 and 69. They had the standard plastic stock model, uh, which is this gun which I have. Uh, they also made a collector's model and a presentation grade. Those were made with wood stocks. The collector's models were made for specific collectors. Uh, they used the first 1,000 serial, uh, serial numbers to, uh, uh, for the collector's guns. The next 2,000 serial numbers were used for the presentation model. Those sales were made directly to retail sales, and they came in special gun cases, uh, foam lined with uh, the guns. Uh, and as I said, those had wooden walnut stocks. Uh, they came with 300 rounds of ammo and along with a set of brass wall hangers. Actually, at that time, the uh, presentation and collector grade both retail for $125, and the standard plastic stock model retailed for $39.95. Ammo was uh, 100 rounds for a dollar, and they were packed in plastic straws, 10, 10 rounds per straw, 10 straws per box. Up here at the top is one of our collector model VLs. Of course, as I said, uh, they had a wooden stock and it came in a special presentation ca uh, case. This gun actually is my gun number 60 that was made for the collection of Warren S. Rybar. Uh, here you have a package that actually contained the uh, 100 rounds of VL ammo, our plastic stock gun which you saw earlier. Now, uh, this display more or less covers 22s produced by daisies over the year. As we said, this was 60, 68 and 69. In uh, 1988, Walmart was buying a little single shot 22 from Ivor Johnson in Little Rock. Uh, Daisy was actually produced in the plastic stock for Ivor Johnson. Uh, they later went bankrupt though, and consequently, we were getting ready to develop a line of 22s for the following year, and Walmart's approached us and ask us, uh, they had acquired all the parts that were left over to build this gun, if we could take all of the parts that they had and build as many guns as possible with the existing parts. Uh, so we said we would. Uh, when we did this, of course, then we had to put our name on it because the gun was being produced by us. So this was a Daisy Model 8, which ended up being built in 1988 for Walmarts. And, uh, we were able to produce approximately 29,000 guns, and they sold those out at a closeout special of $29.95 at that time. The following year, Daisy introduced its own 22 line that it had been working on, and it was called our Legacy line. Now we had uh, a total of six guns, uh, three plastic stock guns, three wooden stock guns, and there were three models within that, a single shot bolt action, a bolt action uh, 
repeater with an eight shot rotary clip and also a semi-automatic. Um, these guns were originally designed for youngsters that were stepping up from the BB pellet gun into their first 22. Um, there were a number of features on the gun. The plastic stock gun had a little button on the stock which you pushed and allowed you to adjust the length of the gun to fit the shooter as you grew. Also, the trigger housings were designed so that the parents could actually remove the trigger housings and put them away for safekeeping until they wanted the kids to have the guns to shoot and, and of course be with them to supervise them. Uh, then we also produced the uh, Woodstock guns and of course as these things went on there was another feature we were going to offer um, and the gun was designed with a hexagon barrel with a liner in it and you could actually uh, remove that barrel and it of course was a standard rifled barrel for 22s. The other barrel we were going to produce was a smoothbore to use with birdshot for the younger shooters. Uh, but the cost of uh, the gun escalated so much that it decided to drop that second barrel and so it never got into production. Uh, of course our costs had gone up quite high and trying to compete with the uh, companies that have been producing uh, firearms over the years, uh, we just really couldn't compete with them and so uh, we only produced the gun for three years, 69, uh, 90, and 91. And then it was discontinued. Over here on this display, we have a compilation of pictures and advertising uh, probably from the 40s and 50s. Uh, up here you see actually some of the original Red Rider ads. Uh, when the gun came out in 1940 and sold for $295 a patent drawing on one of our space pistols. Uh, of course we've seen the uh, picture gun, automatic picture gun that we used before. Actually also a number of uh, movie starlets during the 40s and that using Daisy products. This is a picture of Cass, his dad, E.C. and Mr. Charlie Bennett, our first salesman and president at that time. This was from uh, uh, the 50s. It also one of our biggest things that we were involved with in the 50s was a connection with Walt Disney and uh, uh, we had came out with the uh, Davy Crockett series. We were involved with the uh, Mouseketeers and, and uh, Bobby and Annette Futicello here uh, were involved in this. Uh, most of the Warner Brother pictures that were uh, TV shows put out in the uh, 50s. Um, we were also involved, uh, such as Zorro. This is a picture of um, a Guy Williams, actually, who played Zorro along with his son back at that time. And then even uh, uh, one of the Roy Rogers comic books, uh, along with uh, Daisy ads on the back of them. Daisy's been involved with shooting education uh, dating back to uh, 1948. Uh, at that time they were in conjunction with the uh, NRA where you could actually uh, earn uh, medals and things shooting the guns. Daisy wanted to get into a more formal program so about 1956 they hired a gentleman named Dave Gates. He was a teacher and coach and Dave was hired to set up a shooting education program. This really got underway when we moved to Rogers, Arkansas. And uh, the first guns that we used was Model 99. Later we developed a high uh, accuracy gun in the Model 499 and that's still used in our current program. In the early 60s, uh, Daisy first developed the program and uh, the, the local Rogers JCs, uh, of which I was a member of that chapter, um, went to our Rogers group and uh, laid out the shooting program and it was adopted by the Rogers JCs. Later, we had it adopted by the Arkansas State JCs 
And then finally, we took it to the national chapter in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where it was adopted by the national JC chapter. JCs were involved with this program for many years, but now it's more or less with Boy Scouts, uh, shooting clubs, 4-H clubs of that nature. Uh, after these kids develop and, and you get a state champion, you go to an international match, which is held every July the 4th. And uh, here we have some pictures of uh, matches held at different places. Over on the end here, we actually see a picture of the American Boys Bill of Rights. That was written by Cass Huff in 1947, and it shows an American boy. And um, this was written by Cass, and of course it's still used by us uh, here at DAISY. During the Second World War, of course, DAISY uh, could not use steel and it wasn't even available because it was being used in the war effort. Since our main operations were stamping operations, DAISY sort of was a subcontractor for other companies producing many stamped steel parts. Over here you'll actually see a display of uh, various parts. Some uh, switches that we produced for one of the com uh, companies that were able to used in the Signal Corps, uh, washers, various flat pieces of metal, uh, various things that were produced on a subcontract basis with other companies. In the training of our, our especially our aerial gunners, uh, they actually used a gun like this which was uh, powered by air to train these gentlemen how to shoot uh, these guns before they graduated to the actual bullets. It was basically, we didn't have all the sophisticated sight systems that they have now, and so it was almost like when you shoot a BB gun, if you were low, you would uh, raise the barrel, or if you were high, you'd lower the barrel. So they taught them, training them with these guns, which would shoot upwards of 500 BBs a minute, and um, once they learned this idea, then they graduated them to using regular bullets, live ammo, which included tracer bullets. And of course, they did the same thing. With the BB gun, you could see where your BB was going. With the uh, firearms, with the tracers, you could see the tracer and, of course, allow for it. Uh, during the war, I think there was probably Daisy. Uh, manufactured and sold over two billion BBs that were used in this training method. Since we couldn't build steel guns, we did build two wood guns. The Daisy Commando Repeating Play Gun, which was a corp pop gun, and our little Daisy Chattermatic uh, machine gun, submachine gun. Uh, as you can see, the submachine gun sold for 89 cents, the Commando play guns sold for $1.19. These guns were basically wood, except for, in this case, the uh, turn crank on the, on the machine gun. But those, uh, those were sold just during World War II. Here we have our roll of honor of uh, DAISY employees that served in the armed forces during World War II. And of course, at the top of the list was uh, Cass Huff who was a colonel in the uh, Air Force at that time. Uh, we have the uh, World uh, War II service flag. Up here we have uh, pictures of the P-38, which was a plane that Cass, uh, Colonel Cass Huff flew during the Second World War, uh, a number of planes. But this particular plane, when it was first introduced, they were having problems with uh, the pilots being able to pull out of dies. And through the efforts and of CAS, they were able to figure out what to do with these planes. In doing so, he actually broke the sound barrier, uh, flying over 800 miles an hour in a power dive, and was able to pull the plane out. With that effort, that saved the lives of uh, many of our pilots during the Second World War. This particular art, uh, article was written uh, uh, by the Reader's Digest in February 1944, and the story was called 15 Seconds to Live by Francis Vivian Drake. 
when Cass came home, uh, he actually flew a B-17 home uh, with his crew, and most of the gentlemen on that plane ended up working at Daisy. Floyd Brandon, salesman from our New York office, Cy Scalingi. Uh, anyway, these uh, gentlemen were on the plane. Uh, I happened to be a young lad in uh, Plymouth, Michigan, and I saw this B-17 flying over at a very low altitude, and when I talked to my uncle about it on that weekend, he said that was just Cass coming home from the war. In 1913, uh, Daisy hired a young man named George Rockwell to serve in its advertisement over the next probably 20 years. Uh, he was called the Happy Daisy Boy, and here you can see some of the pictures and the ads that were used at that time, uh, also along with some other kids. But Mr. Rockwell was the principal uh, youngster used uh, during uh, the teens and, and 20s. Over here we have an original painting of a family. This is probably either from the late 40s or early 50s. Uh, where family has been target shooting with her Daisy, actually Red Rider, equipped with our old 300 scope. That was sold as a set back then, the 311 set. Down below, we have again a picture of Cass along with his uh, father, E.C. Huff, and Mr. Charlie Bennett. Uh, this particular uh, picture was actually donated by Sheldon Baker who originally started out mowing lawns at Daisy. After he graduated from high school, he went to work at Daisy, later uh, involved in the tool room, and when we moved to Arkansas, I came down with his family and was the plant manager for Daisy for many years. Down here is a picture, uh, probably from about 1939, uh, when Daisy introduced a new double barrel BB gun, the number 104. Uh, this happy young lad that you see here is uh, taking aim with his uh, Daisy BB gun, and this is one of the um, uh, more collectible items that Daisy has produced over the years. Here we have a bronze plaque which is uh, awarded to Charlie Bennett and Edward Seahoff. Uh, on the 60th anniversary of the Daisy Manufacturing Company. This was in recognition of the super teamwork which has provided the good company with such inspiration and outstanding leadership. And this was presented to these gentlemen in 1948. I might just point out uh, that also between these two gentlemen they had 129 years of service with Daisy. Mr. Bennett, 64 years, and Mr. Huff, 65 years. Over here we have a display of uh, the 50 millionth Daisy air rifle. This was one of our Model 98s, and uh, it uh, w was presented on March 30th of 1960. So. Uh, you also see a catalog page covering some of our various models produced at, at that time, including the Model 98, of course, without the gold barrel. This particular display actually covers uh, advertisements and things from the 60s. Um, of course, we were in our spit and image line, which we had our toy cap pistols, the Cheyenne ricochet gun, holster sets with uh, Clint Walker from the Cheyenne program. Um, Dee Willem was a quick draw artist that was working with Daisy back during that time. Uh, another picture here of Arvo Ojala actually drawing against uh, Jim Arness and Gunsmoke. One of our uh, spin a six gun fast draw booklets that Daisy offered at that time. Advertisements from our boy's life ads on our new spit and image guns, uh, and CO2 pistols also. Here we have an original oil painting of a young man 
uh, that was actually used in the Daisy Bill of Rights posters that came out in 1947. They used this picture at that time, and of course it is still in use with our Bill of Rights. This display covers uh, advertising and catalog pages uh, from the 80s and 90s, uh, various ads using father, sons, uh, along with some of our uh, products at that time, toy guns, uh, Daisy Red Rider play guns, target rifles. Of course, here's a, an article on the one of the most famous Daisy, the Red Rider, that was published, along with our Arkansas can opener, which was a our 922, which over the years, Daisy has produced a number of commemorative rifles, and you actually see some of them here on our display. Uh, we have our Pony Express model, um, the uh, Centennial a commemoration of the Winchester 94, uh, gold, the Gold Rush Collector's Edition. Down here <clears throat> we have the limited edition of the Buffalo Bill, commemorating Buffalo Bill's uh, 100th year of his birth. And then finally we have one of our own, the, the number 25 centennial, centennial celebrating Daisy's 100 years. Uh, the Model 25 was uh, the pet of Kasshoff, and of course it was around from 1914 all the way through 1978. And so uh, he chose the Model 25 as the gun for us to use as our centennial. Uh, Cass uh, wanted a special one-of-a-kind uh, commemorative model made for our centennial. And um, this is what we actually came up with. It was the number 125, um, special stocks, forearms, special engraving, gold and silver inlay. This was uh, put up for auction at the NRA show down in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1986. And uh, with the money raised would go to the National Shooting Sports Youth Foundation. Cass wanted to make sure that uh, Daisy had this gun for display back in its museum, so uh, he ended up being high bidder for the gun, and of course we brought it back and he donated it to the museum. Hi, welcome to the Daisy Museum. My name is Orrin Rybar. Uh, where are you folks from? Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. Well, all of you from Arizona. We are, yes. How did you all end up here? On vacation or something? No, we're here on business actually. We just uh, getting ready to leave and thought we'd come by and check out the museum. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to stop in and see us. We've been over here about four years now. Did uh, you have uh, hopefully a Daisy BB gun when you were a youngster? I sure did. Absolutely many. Yeah. Okay, you want to describe it a little bit? Sure. I had uh, a Daisy BB gun when I was a younger and had a scope on it even. Oh, and uh, okay. <laughs> I used to use it and, and actually hunt a little bit with it and shot some birds and take them home. My dad would show me how to clean them and he ate them. <laughs> Sounds good. And the same had a couple of them, a couple of the, the pump action ones and uh, did the same, just target shooting and having fun. Right. Well, there's, uh, we hear many stories about people when they come in telling us about the things that their exploits with their Daisy BB gun. Some of them get pretty wild, but uh, you know everybody has their own story. And of course, the company goes all the way back to 1882 when it started as a window company up in Plymouth, Michigan. And by 1895, uh, at that time they got a group of uh, Plymouth businessmen together. They put up thirty thousand dollars. You know that doesn't sound like a lot, money back but that was in 1882. It was a lot of money. The first thing they did was buy 25 acres of land and uh, built this two-story, 8,000 square foot building. Uh, by the mid 80s, business was dropping off, and they were ready to close the business. In 89, they made it a decision to build a gun which Mr. Hamilton also had designed, which you see here. 
And uh, the, uh, as he showed this to the general manager of the company, he made the, re uh, the remark, uh, Clarence, that's a daisy. And that was a slang term back then that meant it was neat, swell, sharp, or cool. And so that's what they called the gun. They decided to build the gun and see what would happen. They would put no more money into the company. They either made it or they closed it down. At that time, the big three completely surrounded us. So wage rise, uh, as a small toy manufacturer, we had to compete directly with the automobile industry. The other thing is whatever affected the economy affected the automobile, which affected the uh, employment or unemployment in the state of Michigan, which you see now again. This happens every time there was a downturn in the economy because the first thing people quit buying is automobiles. Uh, so all of these factors put together were involved in making the decision to finally move. And uh, they chose Rogers, Arkansas. And of course, as I said, we've been here uh, 50 years now. So a 48 shot repeater, that was the first repeater. And uh, of course, we added, uh, we went from all metal to a wooden insert, which was an option if you wanted it in the uh, early 90s. And then uh, full wood stocks by the end of the 1890s. Interesting, wow. It came out actually in 1914. It was designed by John named Charles Lefevre. They were famous uh, gun people from St. Louis. Uh, he contacted Daisy that he designed, uh, designed a pump BB gun. And so uh, uh, they decided to have him come and work and build that gun. Uh, he was going to stay at Daisy, but he was still there in 1953. And this was in 1912 when he made that wow. statement. And uh, he was there for a couple more years before he retired. He was a Western artist, and he created the character in 1938. It came out in the Sunday Funny Papers. Mm -hmm. 39, he approached, it was an instant success, so in 39, he approached Daisy uh, about building a gun, and we eventually ended up building the number 111 Model 40 Red Rider in 1940. You'll see it pictured on comic books around the size. And we built that gun, uh, uh, and uh, versions of it are still in production at this time, but the only thing that carries it now is the movie A Christmas Story. Because all of the kids <laughs> nowadays don't even know who Red Ryder and Little Beaver right. were. Yeah. All they know is that was a, little, a gun that uh, Little Ralphie wanted for Christmas, <laughs> but he couldn't have because he chewed his eye so out. I'm Sue Secker, manager of the Daisy Air Gun Museum here in Rogers, Arkansas. Uh, uh, my duties uh, uh, are varied. Uh, maybe one, the most I do is at the computer. We have a website, which is daisymuseum.com, that we get orders uh, from all over the U.S., ship daily. Uh, we also get uh, many, many uh, emails inquiring about old Daisy uh, air guns, what, uh, when, where they, when they were made, uh, what the value might be, and we give those to the curator. Uh, he will answer them, give them back to us, and we email them back to the uh, person who's inquired about them. Um, we, uh, the processing of the orders takes a considerable amount of time. Um, then we, uh, I think probably the most uh, enjoyable things that uh, my job entails is visiting with the uh, many visitors that we have from all over the U.S., the stories that I hear. Um, a reporter who recently did a, uh, an article in the paper about our 50th uh, homecoming uh, uh, anniversary, um, uh, she began as uh, Sue Secker, keeper of memories. Um, uh, there's nothing that uh, I enjoy more than talking with the people and hearing their stories and seeing the uh, expressions on their face when they see uh, an old BB gun that they've had when they were uh, a child and all of the interesting stories, the neat stories that I've heard through the years. Well, I have one of the neatest jobs I think that there is. I just love it. I'm a people person. I love listening to the stories that they have to tell. I love to see the uh, expressions on these men's faces when they come in and you know that they've uh, 
immediately reverted back to their childhood, remembering uh, the times that they've spent with their buddies with their BB guns out in the woods. Um, uh, an, a, a really neat story that just happened recently. Um, a man of about um, oh, mid-50s came in, I think he was from Arizona, and after he uh, toured the museum, he began looking at some uh, a gun to buy, and so he chose the Red Rider Little Beaver set. And when he came up to the, uh, to the desk to pay for it, he said, I want to tell you what I'm going to do with this gun. He said, when, uh, when we were, said I had an older brother, and, um, and my mother would never let him have a BB gun because she was so afraid that he would harm or hurt me as a younger brother. And he said, uh, this brother is turning 60 and I'm going to buy him a BB gun. And he said, not only will he be thrilled with it, but he said, then it's going to uh, rid me of some of the guilt that I felt through the years of m mother using me as an excuse maybe for not getting a BB gun for my older brother. Um, another neat thing that happened, a family was in here one day with a child from, I think they were from Colorado, and um, a week or so after they had left, I got a letter. And when I opened it, a dollar bill fell out, and I couldn't imagine what on earth this dollar bill would be for. And when I opened the sheet of paper, I immediately realized that it was from a small child. And he told me that uh, while he was in the museum, he had taken a BB and that he realized that that was stealing. And he was sorry and he was sending his dollar to pay for that BB that he was, had taken. So I hear all kind of stories. I see all kind of neat things happening. It's just, it's just been a wonderful experience. These people that I deal with, the, the collectors are just some of the most wonderful uh, people that I've ever met. And it was such a, such a neat thing. I'd worked here, I have now for eight years this month and have, uh, visited either by telephone or via the internet with these guys um, and get, being able to put, a, uh, to put a face with this voice has just been uh, uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, I might uh, add that, um, you know, you can always go on to our website if you have a question about your gun. Uh, there is a form that you can fill out. We'll get it to the proper person. They'll look up the information and we'll email it back to you just as quickly as we can. Uh, of course, we'd much rather you come in and visit the museum in person, but if that's impossible, just uh, get in touch with us through uh, the internet or the telephone. We're always here to help. Uh, the curator works here on Fridays from 11 to 4 Central Time. If you, if you could call back then, where did you say you were from? in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, well he'd be glad to talk to you about it if you'd like to call back on Friday. 11 to 4 and we're cent and we're central time, okay? All right. Well, thanks for calling. Bye-bye. The museum gift shop where we carry what Daisy has in their line today. Uh, probably the most uh, sold and famous BB gun is the Red Rider. Uh, we have um, all kinds of targets, uh, and this is one that uh, so many people will pick up and try out, and it's a fun one. If you hit the bullseye, it's one sound. You go for hit the another part of it, and it's a different sound. Uh, of course, we have all the paper targets. Uh, we have uh, the shot, the BBs, in uh, as few as 350 count, up to 4,000 count, and our pellets. Uh, the CO2, um, the 880 is a very popular gun, and then we have some, uh, we have the uh, Neil Punchard um, uh, coffee table book that we sell lots of. It's called The First 100 Years of Daisy Air Rifles and BB Guns. We also sell Gary Garber's new book, An Encyclopedia of Daisy Plymouth Guns. We also have a book here in the museum that James Hales did on all the old buildings in downtown Rogers. 
and of course that uh, includes this old building that uh, we're in here today that used to house a, a drugstore. This year Daisy will build us a special edition limited gun. Uh, one of them that we have now is called the Red Rider and Little Beaver Set. Um, you get a uh, certificate with it uh, that gives the number, the date, and you can have a name put on it. Uh, walnut stock and forearm, they use the little butt for the uh, little, uh, uh, little beaver gun. And we have other limited edition that I'll show you in a few minutes. We also have um, uh, metal pin or metal signs. We have uh, posters. And the one that's uh, one of the favorites is the, uh, uh, this is a copy of the original first ad poster that, uh, or first ad that Daisy ever did. If you call back on Friday, the curator is here and you give him that information and he can, uh, he can tell you what it is. Okay? Ye yes, thanks for calling. We have uh, smaller items that uh, the tourists can uh, purchase here in the uh, gift shop. We have the uh, Daisy playing cards, we have mugs, and then we have the uh, reprint of the It's a Daisy book by uh, Cass Huff. On display here we have all of the guns that we have in the boxes here so that the customers can actually take the guns down. They can uh, get a feel for what they feel like, the weight of them, um, to see if, if they bring their children in maybe to get the first gun they'll see which one fits them best. And this is one of the favorites. This is the famous uh, BB barrel that uh, people can uh, take a collector tin and uh, fill their tin with the BBs or they can just stand here and uh, run their fingers through the BBs and it's not just the little tykes that like to do it but the uh, the older ones also enjoy. So have uh, the CO2 pistols, um, we have slingshots, uh, we have the uh, uh, airstrike pistols that takes the little plastic uh, shot and then the uh, targets for them. We care, we get lots of calls for slingshot replacements. And then back to uh, the special guns that we have. One of, uh, a very favorite one is the uh, 1894 Winchester that we have. You can get any state that you want that's uh, the logo of the state is lasered on and then there's an opening in the center that you can purchase a uh, state quarter. We have a few of the 65th anniversary of the Red Rider guns left. Uh, and also we have uh, racks. We have a four gun rack that will call, uh, uh, will hold the uh, smaller frame guns and then we have shadow boxes that will uh, accommodate the larger frame and we also have the frames to, or shadow boxes that will fit the smaller frame guns.